This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to mounting calls for President Trump to resign and the escalating war of words between Trump and his accusers over multiple claims of sexual harassment and assault. This week, New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand became the fifth senator to call for Trump to step down. In response, Trump attacked Gillibrand, tweeting, quote, lightweight Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, a total flunky for Chuck Schumer and someone who would come to my office begging for campaign contributions not so long ago and would do anything for them, is now in the ring fighting against Trump." End quote. On Tuesday, Gillibrand fired back, saying Trump's attack was sexist. It was a sexist smear attempting to silence my voice. And I will not be silenced on this issue. Neither will the women who stood up to the president yesterday, and neither will the millions of women who have been marching since the Women's March to stand up against policies they do not agree with. The USA Today editorial board jumped in with an unusually forceful editorial titled, Will Trump's Lows Ever Hit Rock Bottom?, writing, quote, A president who would all but call Senator Kirsten Gillibrand a whore is not fit to clean the toilets in the Barack Obama presidential library or to shine the shoes of George W. Bush. That again, a USA Today editorial. Meanwhile, three of the 16 women who've publicly accused Trump of sexual harassment, held a news conference on Monday here in New York, demanding Congress take action. The women shared accounts in which they said Trump groped, fondled and forcibly kissed them. Monday's press conference was held by Brave New Films, which released the documentary Sixteen Women and Donald Trump in November. This is an excerpt. He groped me. He absolutely groped me. And he just slipped his hand there, touching my private part. He turned to me and um, embraced me and gave me a kiss on the lips. And I, I remember being shocked and, because I would have just thought to shake somebody's hand, but that was his first response with. It was a real shock when all of a sudden his hands were all over me. But it's when he started putting his hand up my skirt and that was it, that was it. The person on my right, who, unbeknownst to me at that time, was Donald Trump, put their hand up my skirt. He did touch my vagina through my underwear. As the women walked across the table, um, Donald Trump would look up under their skirt and, you know, comment on whether they had underwear or didn't have underwear. I didn't want to have to walk across the table. I wanted to get out of there. Then his hand touched the right inside of my breast. I felt intimidated and I felt powerless. Lana was standing right next to him when he touched my butt. When we entered the room, he grabbed each of us tightly in a hug and kissed each one of us without asking permission. After that, I received another call from either Donald or a male calling on his behalf, offering me $10,000. His actions are a huge testament to his character, that of uncontrollable misogyny, entitlement, and being a sexual assault apologist. I'm, you know, sitting there in my robe and having, you know, my makeup and hair done and everything, and he comes walking in, and I was just like, oh my goodness, so like, what is he doing saw, back here? Saw, I saw him walk into the dressing room. He just came strolling right in. There was no second to put a robe on or any sort of clothing or anything. Um, some girls were topless, other girls were naked. Waltzing in, when we're naked or half naked in a very physically vulnerable position. And he came to me and started kissing me open mouthed as he was pulling me towards him. He then grabbed my shoulder and began kissing me again very aggressively and paced his placed his hand on my breast. And I said, come on, man, get real. He repeated my words back to me, get real, as he began thrusting his genitals. That's an excerpt from 16 Women and Donald Trump, released by Brave New Films. Well, in response to these accusations from now 16 women, President Trump tweeted Tuesday, quote, Despite thousands of hours wasted and many millions of dollars spent, the Democrats have been unable to show any collusion with Russia, so now they're moving on to the false accusations and fabricated stories of women who I don't know and or have never met. Fake news, he tweeted. 
Well, for more, we're joined by one of Trump's accusers, one of the women who have decided to speak out. We're joined by Jessica Leeds, who says Donald Trump groped her in the first-class cabin of a commercial flight. Jessica Leeds has recently retired after working 30 years as a stockbroker. She's the mother of two, grandmother of eight, and she joins us now in our New York studio. Jessica Leeds, welcome to Democracy thank Now! You. And thank you for bravely taking this time to tell your story. So take us back to that day in 1979. Well, I was traveling for a paper company as a sales rep. There were very few women at that time working on the road. So it was not unusual for the steward to come back and ask me if I wanted to come up to first class. And I was delighted, because the food was better, the seats were more comfortable. So I, I came up, and uh, the gentleman sitting on the um, window side and right at the bulkhead, um, I sat down, and he introduced himself as Donald Trump. At that time, I knew nothing about the Trump Organization, Donald Trump, or anything, because I did not work out of New York City. I was based in Connecticut, but I flew in and out of New York. Well, they served the meal, and after it was cleared, he jumped all over me and started groping me and kissing me and this. And at the time, I remember thinking, why doesn't the guy across the aisle come to my aid? Why doesn't the stewardess come back? You know, but nothing was said. I didn't say anything. I don't remember him saying anything. How did he first— You had been talking at lunch while you were eating? A little bit. Not, uh -huh. not a lot. Not a lot. And he just turned to you? Yeah. Yeah. And did what? And started grasping me and pulling me and groping my breasts and trying to kiss me. But it's when he started to put his hand up my skirt that I managed to wiggle out, because I'm not a small person. And I also managed to remember my purse and went to the back of the airplane, and, and that was the rest of the flight. To where the flight attendants are, you just went right. back to the very right. back. Right, right. Right. And uh, when the plane landed, I made sure that everybody was off the plane before I did, because I didn't want to run into him again. I did not complain to the airlines. I did not complain to my boss. That was, n that was not done. There were all sorts of silly things that would happen on airplanes, like, guys, you want to join the Mile High Club? I mean, they would, you know, these were things that, at that time, we tolerated. So, fast forward, I left and, and came to New York City. This was, like, in, like, 81, 82. I got a job with the Humane Society of New York, and they were having this, this um, fundraising gala at Saks Fifth Avenue. And I'm the new kid on the block, so I'm really, really thrilled to be involved with this. And it was a, a wonderful New York sparkly night, and I got to meet all these designers who are now since gone, but Oscar Lee De La Renta and Bill Blass and Jeffrey Beam and Mary McFadden and all of them. And up comes I'm I'm at the table that gave out the table assignments. Up comes Trump with his wife Ivana, who's very pregnant, and. I look at him, and by this time, having worked for the Humane Society, I was aware of who this guy was. Um, the Trump family and everybody on the society scene was very important to the Humane Society to bring him in. So I'm remembering him. But I hand him this, um, this chit, and he looks at me, and he says, I remember you. You're that—and he used the C word from the airplane. A C word used to refer to a woman. Yes. Yes. And it was like it had been a crowded scene around the table, but it was like all of a sudden everybody just sort of disappeared. And it's not that I felt threatened, but I felt very much alone. And he took his tick and he went and he went on. Well, Fast forward to 2015 and 16, when I realized that Trump was actually going to run for president, I started telling everybody who would stand for it, my family, my friends, everybody and anybody, my book club, my neighbors, 
everybody, I would say, listen, let me tell you what kind of a person Donald Trump is. This was my experience with him. For the most part, they were women, and for the most part, they believed me. There were some that didn't, because it was a long time ago. But coming up to the debates, it was the second debate, and when Anderson Cooper challenged Trump, have you ever groped a woman? He said, no, 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 let's talk about Syria. And Anderson didn't let him off the hook. Have you ever groped a woman? No, no, no. Well, I'm on my feet yelling at the TV, because, you know, yes, you did. And I didn't sleep well that night. And I got up in the morning, and I picked up my newspaper, and I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll write a letter to the editor. And I my, opened up my computer, and my email was flying out the wall. I, it just was incredible. All my friends saying, you got to say something now. You got to say something. So I composed this letter to the editor. I sent it off to the New York Times, went swimming, came back a couple of hours later, and there was a message from the Times, would I please call them? And I did. And this woman reporter, Megan Tui, um, questioned me. I mean, we talked for over an hour, and then she said, can I send a reporter? <sighs> this for a letter to the editor? You know. So, yes, she sent a reporter. He and I talked for about two hours, and he took the names of the people that I had told, like my son, like my nephew, like my friends, like my neighbor. And they called them and said, and asked them, did Jessica tell you this story over the past year? And they all uh, confirmed that that's what I had done. So then the Times asked, well, can we do a video? And by this time, I'm going, wow, this is <laughs> getting pretty strange. And they did a video, and that came out Wednesday night. And then Thursday morning, I opened my door and pick up my newspaper, and it's below the fold. But there's my picture. And I remember thinking, holy shit. <laughs> now, for about a couple of months, and then there was a, this um, uh, interview with Anderson Cooper, and I agreed to that because he was the guy who asked the question. And he treated me, ve I thought, very, very well. And, and we had a good conversation. But then my kids insisted that I leave the city, because there was people hanging around the door. And since I'm too old to know how to do the Internet and the Facebook and all that, um, I have no idea of, of the, the hate mail that, that came in. And we disconnected the phone, and I left town for, for a couple of days. I went out to a small town in Pennsylvania. And the next day, we go to the post office, and the women in the post office come up to me, and they say, thank you, and you're so brave. We go to the bank. The tellers at the bank, the customers in the bank, come out and say, thank you, and you're so brave. We go to the farmer's market. We go to the grocery store. The neighbors in Robin's neighborhood all come in when they find out that I'm there, and they all say the same thing. They say, thank you, and you're so brave. I come back to the city. I go to the Y for, for swimming and for exercise, and the women started coming up to me. But they also said, I have a story. So I began to hear all these stories, some of them really horrific, some of them very minor. This guy in my office came in, and he took my breath. I was like, holy shit, he did what? So it went on for a while, and then things calmed down. And then the anniversary of, well, and Trump got elected. And it was extremely disappointing. I want to go to two clips. This is President Trump speaking before he was president on the campaign trail in October 2016. He said all the women who accused him—you'd come out at this point— of sexual misconduct were liars. 
Every woman lied when they came forward to hurt my campaign. Total fabrication. The events never happened. Never. All of these liars will be sued after the election is over. That was Donald Trump in 2016, who said he would sue all of the women, the liars, who had come out and made allegations against him. Now let's go to comments President Trump made about our guest Jessica Leeds on the campaign trail last October. The only way they figure they can slow it down is to come up with people that are willing to say, oh, I was with Donald Trump in 1980. I was sitting with him on an airplane. And he went after me on the plane. Yeah, I'm going to go after. <laughs> Believe me, she would not be my first choice, that I can tell you. Man. <laughs> that was Donald Trump, and you're laughing, Jessica Leeds. Well, it is, it is so absurd uh, that, for him, beauty is, is the primary uh, attraction. And uh, he, I, he didn't pick me. I was there. I was available. He was bored. So I have to be totally realistic. But I'm, I'm 75 years old now, and everybody sees a 75-year-old grandmother. But I was okay when I was in my 30s. I did. I was presentable. And the jobs that I had, like the sales job, I got because I was pretty enough. You know, I'm just thinking about the woman who spoke alongside you, Rachel Crooks, mm -hmm. who also just happened to be there. Right. She was in the building of right. her landlord. Her right. landlord was Donald Trump. She worked in that building. And this is Rachel speaking at Monday's news conference, along with Jessica, who says Trump forcibly kissed her against her will in 2005, when she was headed to work. About 12 years ago, as a young receptionist in Trump Tower, I was forcibly kissed by Mr. Trump during our first introduction. Mr. Trump repeatedly kissed my cheeks and ultimately my lips in an encounter that has since impacted my life well beyond the initial occurrence and feelings of self-doubt and insignificance I had. Unfortunately, given Mr. Trump's notoriety and the fact that he was a partner of my employers, not to mention the owner of the building, I felt there was nothing I could do. Given this hostile work environment, my only solution at the time was to simply avoid additional encounters with him. I do realize that in the grand scheme of things, there are far worse cases of sexual harassment, misconduct, and assault. But make no mistake, there is no acceptable level of such behavior. That some men think they can use their power, position, or notoriety to demean and attack women speaks to their character, not ours. Which, believe me, is a tough lesson learned. In my case, I only felt the redemption of knowing it was not my own flaws to blame when I read the account of Temple Taggart, whose story had so mirrored my own that I finally felt absolved of the guilt that I had somehow projected an image that made me an easy target. Instead, this was serial misconduct and perversion on the part of Mr. Trump. So that's Rachel Crooks. You were mm -hmm. sitting next to her. You each told your story and what happened to Rachel. You didn't know her until now, until— no. Of the 16, I, and, and originally it was like 10 or 12, and more have come forward, but, but as far as I am aware and the input that I've gotten, we've—none of us have talked to each other. So the thing that I found, for myself, comforting was the fact that the stories were basically similar. Rachel ended up quitting and going home. Rachel was so intimidated that she quit her job and went back to Ohio. So. We lost somebody in the city because of, of the aggression. You're now calling for a congressional investigation? Yes. Yes. Explain. Well, the problem with the um, political scene is the fact that Trump really feels like he doesn't have anybody over him. He doesn't have—there's nobody telling him—nobody's the boss of the White House except Trump. It's up to Congress. To, to haul the, to bring him to task for, for who he is and what he is. I'm hoping the Mueller investigation will do it, but, but uh, at this point, I have to do 
have to continue doing what I feel is important about the sexual aggression issues. So it's up to—I think it's up to Congress to, to step forward. Fifty-six women in Congress. Have. Five senators, um, four of them men, one of them Kristen Gillibrand, who he just um, uh, verbally attacked, mm -hmm. um, have called for his resignation. Yes. Well, that would be something else, too. But he's, he, he will never, I think. It's just like he doesn't remember these things anymore. He, as I said, he remembered me after a couple of years, and I'm, I'm not sure why. But he doesn't remember, because he, he's done it all his life. If, if some investigative power could go back and check with his high school and college years, I bet the women that he dated then had the same experience. And clearly, this is not just about dating. No. No, this this is this is the the label sexual aggression. It really is. It's and it's control over something. He he just ha I love it when he says he appreciates women, but he doesn't. What he wants is some arm candy. And you've talked about the massive discrepancy between women survivors remembering every single oh. detail of what happened and male what, abusers completely forgetting. What what yeah. W women remember in exquisite detail when it happened, how it happened, where it happened, how they got out of it, how they got home. Most of them talked about throwing their clothes away. Most of them said that they felt responsible for what happened, and they didn't want to tell anybody, even their parents or their spouses or everything. They remember it, whether they were 8 years old or whether they were 30 years old. You said you never wore a dress on a plane again. I stopped wearing skirts. I started, oh, pantsuits were the— Because he reached up your yeah, skirt. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to—and I cut my hair from, from being long to, to short. It was one of those things where you, as and this is what I object to, you as the victim take on the responsibilities to somehow or another prevent these situations from happening. Rod Rosenstein testified before the House. Luis Gutierrez was one of the Congress members questioning him. This was about Robert Mueller. But he, Luis Gutierrez, said to the deputy uh, attorney general, if a man did this to a woman, and describe, well, let's go to that moment with the Chicago congressman questioning Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. When the him in question is Donald Trump, there really should be no further discussion, because as everybody, regardless of their political affiliations or partisanship, can clearly see, we have a man in the presidency who has a very difficult relationship with the truth. In this case, we have women who were made to feel powerless and insignificant, who at great personal cost and risk have come forward. And I believe them. I do. I think were he on the subway or in a restaurant, would not either or both of these incidents be enough to get him arrested? In your experience as the number two most important law enforcement officer in the United States? That was Luis Gutierrez uh, in a House hearing yesterday. Your final comment. I am amazed. We need more men coming out and saying things like this congressperson, and, and I'm, I'm really hopeful. The, the problem is the men that, that perpetrate this, for them, it's like scratching an itch. It doesn't mean anything, and they just don't comprehend the psychological damage that they're doing to, to their victims. And, you know, some of them never recover, and they're basket cases for the rest of their life. Some of them are well-grounded, like like Samantha from—, from Samantha yeah, Holvey, we had on she, the show on Tuesday. Yeah, she Tuesday. is absolutely right on, based, and, and doing just fine. But there are a lot of women who have experienced all sorts of—, of uh, that, that never recover. Do you want President Trump to resign? Oh, resign, uh, be taken out. Uh, absolutely. Be taken out by the Congress members yes, who are calling exactly. for this congressional I mean, his, investigation. His administration is a mess. We don't even have a, 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 
a embassy person in in South Korea. Please. You know. Well, on that note, I want to say thank you so much. And we're going to move on to an international issue next: the issue of Yemen. Jessica Leeds, one of 16 women who've accused President Trump of sexual misconduct. Uh, Jessica Leeds and two other women uh, spoke out at a news conference in Manhattan on Monday. You can see Samantha Holvey's discussion on Democracy Now on Tuesday. She was Miss North Carolina. She participated in the Miss USA contest, the contest owned by President Trump. She talks about what he did in those pageants. Jessica Leeds has recently retired after working 30 years as a stockbroker, mother of two, grandmother of eight. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, Yemen. Stay with us.